Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Grand Rounds presentation. I have the honor of uh, welcoming our speaker for today, the introduction of whom I'll do in just a moment, but I'm going to begin with a few housekeeping items. First of all, what happened to the weather? That's not a housekeeping item. That's just a, an expression of frustration. It was hailing, snowing, raining, and sunny in the last 15 minutes outside. If you're new to Rochester, welcome. If you're still here, thank you for your loyal support. Um, perhaps we'll hear a little bit about the weather in Vermont shortly from our speaker. But by way of housekeeping, I just wanna remind you of a few things. This Grand Rounds is being delivered uh, both live and virtually through a webinar format, which means that for those of you who are logging in by Zoom, we welcome you to use the Q&A feature to share comments, questions, uh, reactions, high fives, all of those can be entered in the Q&A section and we will moderate some discussion with our speaker at the end of her presentation. For those of you who are here live, um, you don't have to do that. You could just raise your hand at the end and we'll be happy to share your questions and concerns at the conclusion um, of the talk today. The second thing that I wanna mention is the importance of getting your feedback on these presentations, both in terms of being able to share them with the speaker, um, as well as looking as a whole at our Grand Round series and integrating your feedback as we look ahead to even next year, which we're already in the midst of planning. So either when you see the QR code come up live on the screen or on the doors on your way out, or if you're attending by Zoom, to please click on the link that gets sent to you in your email at the conclusion of the talk, and do share your feedback using that uh, feedback form. That is also the mechanism through which you can receive continuing medical education or continuing education credit for your discipline. Without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, who is Sarah Pavlovsky. Um, she is a, this is like such a cool and impressive person. And the work that she does is both near and dear to our hearts for those of us in collaborative care, but I, I will let you decide how cool she is in just a moment. She's a child, adolescent and adult psychiatrist with the title of Associate Professor of Psychiatry at UVM. She's a supervisor in the Psychiatry Resident Clinic for Outpatient Training in the UVM Psychiatry Residency Program and Division Chief of Primary Care Mental Health Integration. I don't know why we don't have, I mean, kind of we do have that-ish. Okay, well, we, we might have that in the future. Um, Division Chief of Primary Care Mental Health Integration for the Network Department of Psychiatry. Her clinical focus is on the implementation of a primary care mental health integration model in the specialties of pediatrics, family medicine, and adult medicine practices across her network. So we are very excited for her session today, which is entitled The Hub and Spoke Model for Pediatric Mental Health Care which will be a translation of Vermont's addiction treatment model to primary care mental health integration. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Pavlovsky and I'm gonna take my seat. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. First, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to do this. Um, I had connected with Dr. Nazra around our University of Vermont e-consult work, which is also part of our uh, collaborative care model. So, so appreciative to be here and to share about what we are doing with our program, which is certainly in its infancy, but we have a lot of lessons learned in our um, adventures and implementation um, and combining of these two models. So I have no financial interests or relationships to disclose. And here are my learning objectives for today. I first want to review the hub and spoke model of care, which originated in Vermont for opioid use disorder and some of the benefits and challenges we've had um, in applying that to psychiatry specialty services. I also wanted to touch upon the current landscape of collaborative care, um, and I was asked to focus particularly on pediatrics um, and its growing literature support and some criticisms. And then I also wanted to look at um, the differences and challenges in mental health care delivery through that model when it's applied to children, youth, and families, and look at some possible adjustments to improve the success of those models. 
So first, I just wanted to touch upon the national context. And as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, um, even in my training, I'm well aware that we are a scarce resource. There are about 10,000 child and adolescent psychiatrists in practice and um, 15 million estimated youth in need of child psychiatry expertise. Um, this results in an average caseload of more than 1,500 patients per child and adolescent psychiatrist. And the ratio of child and adolescent psychiatrists per 100,000 youth ranges from four in Wyoming to 65 in the District of Columbia, and the national average is 14. Um, youth in rural areas and areas of socioeconomic disadvantage have severely limited access. And as you can see from that national map, um, most of us exist in a severe shortage area, although in New York and Vermont, we are in a high shortage area. So with the prevalence of mental illness and the need for uh, highly skilled providers is rising, um, we really are in a predicament where we have increased incidence of depression, anxiety, and suicidality among children. Um, and pediatric health experts have said that we are in a national child and adolescent mental health emergency. So what do we do about this? Um, can we just keep on going like this? Um, and the thought is, no, we, we really do need a new, different, novel, creative approach to how we have mental health care. Um, and the thought is that in primary care, we have a bit of better statistics about um, our connection with any doctors. For example, most adolescents have visits yearly, 94% um, to any doctor, 91% per a 2019 NHIS study um, for well check visits. So adolescents are receiving care across different settings, um, perhaps not in a child psychiatry specialty clinic, um, but the idea is that if we are to be in uh, primary care, we may catch more of the kids that we need to see. This is the regional context of Vermont, although I can say that it seems to connect with a national context as well. Um, the idea is that we have a lot of emergency room psychiatry care and patients are waiting, um, children, adolescents, adults in our emergency rooms for day to week, days to weeks. I don't think this is unique to Vermont. It seems to be a national issue as well. Um, in addition to that, we have an inpatient uh, capacity crisis as well. We don't have enough beds, um, which is why patients are often in the emergency rooms. And then you couple that with a uh, challenge in outpatient treatment capacity. I put here the long wait times that we have um, at the medical center in, uh, in Vermont. The adult wait time is 145 days to an appointment for a psychiatrist. And for children, it's 167 days. Um, and as a mother of <laughs> two young children, I can definitely say that when you are worried about a child in a mental health crisis, uh, waiting that long to receive care um, that you hope to receive in hours to days um, is, is just such a distressing experience. Um, we're doing a bit better at the Behavioral Health Services North, BHSN, which has had primary care mental health integration for longer, although children are still waiting about 90 days for an appointment. Um, so when you couple that with the fact that we have estimated a 96% unmet prescriber need, it's about 90% for um, child and adolescent psychotherapy and other forms of psychotherapy, we really are in a place where a lot of our systems aren't um, working as they should, and we're not really seeing all the people that are in need. We also have uh, some challenges in outpatient utilization. So for example, 50% of those who are referred do not follow up with that appointment. So if you think about it, if you're uh, referred out six months ago, you probably maybe hopefully tried to have care elsewhere. Um, who can really wait that long to get the care that they need? Um, or some people just don't have care at all. So that is the um, kind of the result of all of these systems um, and the challenges that we're in. Even when people do follow up, the average number of visits is less than two, which we know is um, really not probably completely adequate for many of the needs as well. So this all in combination makes for an enormous impact, certainly in our health at work and region. And I'll just add a little bit more depth to this about the increasing demand and uh, reduced supply of the services. As you can see, prevalence is very high, particularly in our primary care patients and ED patients. Um, 
We're at about 31% of primary care patients who have mental health or substance use disorders on their problem list, and a pretty high estimate of 58% for emergency room patients. So you can see that in lack of access to outpatient care, people are using other forms of care to get their needs met. So the Vermont Hub and Spoke approach is considered to be a pretty successful model. It was developed by Dr. John Brooklyn in Vermont as a way to deliver um, opioid use disorder care. It focuses on the spokes being mostly primary care offices, about 75 throughout Vermont. And the hubs are um, in number about nine, including the Addiction Treatment Center, where I've done my you know, residency and fellowship training. And the idea is that much of the care can be done within the spokes, but there needs to be um, kind of an interconnection between the specialty care and the hubs and um, the intensive care provided there and that which is available in the spokes. So within the spokes, you may see uh, maintenance mat teams, um, ongoing prescriptions of buprenorphine, and then combined team members who can help um, with patients to ensure or keep um, patients as stable as possible through licensed alcohol and drug counselors and other forms of counseling. However, if someone is in need of more acute care um, or more care in general, they can then transition back to the hub, which also provides ongoing consultation and training to the spokes to really increase the overall skill set um, available in the spokes and primary care. So it's thought to be a successful model um, with access to over 6,000 patients and use of this model. Um, and it actually works very well with, I think, the the collaborative care model um, developed through the University of Washington and the um, Advancing Integrative Mental Health Solutions approach. Um, so to just briefly review the core components of the collaborative care model, um, which we are using in combination with the hub and spoke model, you generally have to do these models, uh, two major resources that are added to a primary care team. You have a behavioral health care manager, and in Vermont, we have named them collaborative care mental health uh, clinicians. Happy to explain why we did that uh, later on in the teaching session. Um, and then you also have psychiatrists working in really a um, consultation mode and also doing a direct service. You combine that with a registry, which has a list of patients in the practice and their PHQ-9 and GAD-7 scores generally. And those scores can be tracked over time in a treat-to-target approach. Um, the behavioral health care manager would be using different cognitive behavioral therapy protocols and also meeting with the psychiatrist on a weekly basis to review their caseload. And so the consultation is done through um, the caseload of the behavioral health care manager. Although we've also done a lot of direct service work as well, which I'm happy to elaborate on later. So this is our outpatient mental health strategic plan back in 2017. Um, as you can tell, since it's years later, we are a bit delayed uh, related to our cyber attack and the COVID pandemic and the full implementation of these services. We've been clinically working at about 18 um, primary care sites across pediatrics, family medicine, and adult medicine over the year. And the planning and the um, attaining funding and the rest of that was several years before. But as you can see, our, our plan um, in the beginning was to, of course, add resources such as behavioral health care managers, develop an interdisciplinary team approach, use that, you know, that third bullet point is really the proactive registry use where you're looking at people who are in high need, high risk, or utilizing care in the emergency room or adult inpatient, and then having uh, and recruiting psychiatrists to oversee and support the teams and to provide both indirect and direct care within the medical home. And it was thought that this kind of model would help us in a variety of ways. Obviously, it was thought to really prioritize access and improving access to mental health services um, to increase the number of providers available and hopefully increase the um, ability for people to be seen in primary care um, when they may not have the follow through with the um, scheduled out outpatient visits. Um, we also had hoped it would reduce stigma and Really, there is a, a large hope that it will reduce the use of higher uh, acuity services in the emergency room and inpatient. This is our uh, overall structure. Um, we have a network program leadership. I'm one of um, 
three. Uh, I represent the mental health group. Um, and then we have a primary care leader and a program administrator. And then for each site, we have funded a primary care champion, so a site lead, um, in order to um, work with the culture change in implementing this model and to champion the model. We also have the um, administrator as the site supervisor um, and the psychiatrist um, providing leadership at each site. And we have care managers, usually on a one-to-one -one, um, ratio with sites themselves. It's a little bit more of a detailed team structure. We have uh, one full-time equivalent behavioral health care manager per 5,000 attributed lives. So again, it, it ends up being about one to two behavioral health care managers per practice. And the psychiatric consultant um, is funded at one FTE per 30,000 attributed lives. So the psychiatric consultant is spread, um, you know, obviously thinner than the behavioral health care manager and doing much more of that kind of indirect service versus direct service. Um, serving up to five different practices. And I, I put here the uh, patient information that we provide to introduce them to the new resources and people on their team and a discussion about what the possible cost could be for the care. So I think COCM and the hub and spoke model both um, have a natural connection and our Blueprint for Health, which is a funding resource in Vermont, has made um, a proposal for continued expansion of the hub and spoke model and to support more access to not just the substance use disorder services through integration with primary care and MAT teams, but to also uh, improve upon the overall mental health um, services available as well. This is the hub and spoke model for primary care mental health integration. As you can see, we're using the spoke in a similar way to the um, original hub and spoke model in primary care. The roles are to identify um, patients who are in need. We use the referral, which is a population, uh, we use a population health registry, which tracks um, scores on screening. Um, and we also use a referral and we've retained using a direct referral to our team and have found that to be pretty important. Um, the way I think about it is that it's very hard to um, go to a PCP and show someone you've proactively identified in a registry report and say you want to work with them. But what about the person who is really in need who they just met five minutes ago um, and, you know, you really want to make sure that you're addressing all of the concerns in primary care and the ones that come up um, in other ways than a registry as well. Primary care, we also have um, a partnership in which they're responsible really for maintenance mental health treatment. Um, we've expanded their repertoire beyond uh, depression, anxiety, um, to bipolar disorder and psychosis. Um, However, you know, that that is a real challenge because it's a new set of um, prescribing and a whole new understanding of diagnoses. So we pair that with ongoing education and training of PCPs. We've done different, we've um, gone about this different ways. Um, when I was initially working as a co-located uh, consultant, I would do brown bag lunches and um, we do something called short talks in which I do 10 minute talks on ADHD and do that 10 times over the course of a month. Um, we've really settled on the ECHO model through the uh, University of New Mexico. Um, we've created a mini fellowship in which we have a session ongoing now um, on depression that's over the course of six sessions where we introduce someone to the assessment of depression, the collaborative care model approach to depression, and then go through um, advanced psychopharmacology on depression. And the idea is that um, in doing that uh, twice a year and covering all the diagnoses, including anxiety disorders, which is our next seasonal uh, offering, someone would create um, a large amount of knowledge around psychiatry that would then extend their um, expertise and ability in primary care. So the um, primary care uh, provider will then refer to the PCMHI team. Our team um, is uh, inspired by the AIMS model through the University of Washington. We continue to track outcomes and a treat to target approach, um, primarily with PHQ-9 and GAD-7. And the psychiatrist is really used um, not just for consultation to the behavioral health care manager on their caseload, but also for diagnosis and the first step in treatment planning. So I may see someone 
someone for a diagnostic visit and then follow them up to six sessions um, over time to ensure that the first step in their treatment planning is going well. And then we use um, the that particular consultant, um, I'm one of several, um, as a person who can essentially gatekeep um, outpatient psychiatry care and more extended psychiatry care. So we identify the need for someone who um, does need to see someone over a longer course of period than we, uh, longer course of time than we offer. And then we connect them with uh, the PCMHI extension program. Um, this is a program which continues with the similar outcomes and is tied to the psychiatrists um, who do PCMHI. So we have shared cases, clinical supervision, consultation groups. They generally have worked with patients longer, greater than three months to up to a year. And the idea is that it's still a time-limited resource, um, so the person doesn't end up in the same situation as many outpatient providers where they fill up and then they no longer have access, but they continue with a patient until target outcomes are reached or um, a year max. So the idea is that this person is able to address more complex factors that you know, I may feel uncomfortable doing an initial consultation and um, having a diagnosis of a personality disorder that um, then complicates treatment resistant depression. But someone who works with someone over the course of the year may um, feel like that they've been able to get to know someone with more depth so they can understand better the refractory nature of their symptoms. And then that information can go back towards the uh, PCP who then hopefully has more depth um, of understanding of the uh, patient and why um, they may be treatment resistant. So there are certainly challenges in doing this kind of modeling of care. Um, we certainly run into challenges with funding, which I think is what any group trying to do uh, any integrated model will find, um, particularly with the PCMHI extension group. I think some of the feedback and the hope is that COCM alone can solve outpatient psychiatry access problems. Um, and I have found that not to be the case. I think there's a really important um, part of this work that requires uh, outpatient specialty service. And I don't think it can really replace outpatient specialty service. Although I know that from a leadership standpoint, there was hope that this was like the one investment to be made. Um, I've really come to see that COCM is is on a spectrum of care and that needs to be intricately linked to outpatient psychiatry and emergency room psychiatry and um, inpatient psychiatry among other programs like our intensive outpatient and um, partial hospitalization programs. So while we may be the most accessible um, or we hope to be um, in primary care, we also need to have those connections. Um, so we're working with people and able to connect them to the correct level of services if we are not the right space for them. Them. Another challenge that we faced are that screening measures, despite many of our professional organizations saying they are and should be universal, are not. Um, and there is resistance to more and more additional work and checklists um, with a question of why doesn't um, the mental health provider just do all the checklists? Um, and my thought is often that if we're looking at this from a population health lens in order to do the resource allocation, we do need to know what the population looks like and who has more moderate scores um, or severe scores. So my doing the screening to you know, work with me doesn't seem to uh, solve that issue of how do we uh, correctly allocate the resources. And the last piece um, is really around the cultural change, which I think I think I notice intra uh, department and outside of it, which is why do we not just expand outpatient services in the traditional way if we just continuously expanded um, a private practice model, um, then that would solve the issue. But I think with that 96% dearth of um, resources, uh, the idea that we can recruit and um, retain people to do uh, outpatient services without them filling up um, seems to be a, a really impossible um, and unrealistic task for us. So this is our landscape. Um, 
UVM Health Network is a network of um, practices. Um, there's about 37 primary care practices across pediatrics, family medicine, and adult medicine. Um, it, UVM Medical um, Center covers the Chittenden County area, and then we have other network hospitals as well. We've done pretty well. I have all in red the places of which we have um, primary care mental health integration. Um, we've done you know pretty well in the local Burlington area, although we have haven't um, yet gone out into uh, New York and that catchment area. Um, we have other partners through the uh, Porter and um, the CVMC Medical Center. And so we're starting to, you know, implement there as well. Um, I think one of the challenges is it's a team-based approach. So um, recruiting and hiring both a psychiatrist and a, a mental health clinician at the same time hasn't always happened. So we have some sites in which, you know, we do not, for example, at Porter have a psychiatrist. And that has some limitations, particularly in the billing of collaborative care codes where the psychiatrist is essential. So Thankfully, we've been able to leverage um, with a large catchment area, um, the role of telepsychiatry. And this was really uh, thrust upon us during the pandemic, but we've kept using it. Um, it allows, um, for example, a newly recruited psychiatrist to cover five different practices across a large region. And in this way, a psychiatrist um, with um, you know several different behavioral health care managers can touch the lives of many different patients. So while I, as a psychiatrist doing a traditional outpatient may see one patient um, per hour, I can provide the same level of caseload supervision to many different patients with the care manager who has a caseload of 50 to 80, thereby using the expertise to touch many more lives. The evidence base for COCM is robust. Um, I think we're up to about 100 randomized clinical control trials across uh, multiple countries, multiple settings consistently. It's more effective than care as usual in primary care for mental health symptoms. Um, and there is emerging evidence um, for adolescent populations. And then this is a um, graphic of where the state of the evidence is. And I will just point out that a lot of the evidence is in mild to moderate depression. That's for both adults and adolescents. And some of the feedback that we get um, is that, you know, the primary care providers feel quite comfortable um, managing mild to moderate depression. And we feel that we want to keep with an evidence base um, of collaborative care. So there is a challenge where a primary care provider maybe um, wants the collaborative care team to work with someone who has psychosis or you know, a bipolar disorder or um, an manic episode. And that's where they really need um, the support. So we've been able to flexibly provide that support um, and offer more direct services for people in that situation. However, it is challenging to balance um, what we know about the evidence base and that maybe, um, you know, a primary care provider isn't comfortable with uh, severe and complex um, patients with depression, even though there is, you know, weaker evidence for that in collaborative care. So with challenges across our system and access, we may be the, um, in primary care, we may be the one group that is really accessible. Um, and otherwise we're looking at emergency care or inpatient care, um, and those aren't always the correct level either. We also have some challenges in access to community mental health resources, um, particularly since um, the criteria for them can be up to three hospitalizations in one year. So you can imagine that someone um, with schizophrenia who is psychotic and in need of ongoing treatment and medication management, you know, doesn't quite, um, isn't quite treated in the collaborative care model, certainly wouldn't, you know, necessarily meet criteria for a community health program. If we don't have outpatient services, including, you know, a private practice a physician who wants to take that person on, then many people are seen in primary care and receive their care there. So we're in a bit of a, a bind with all of that, um, as I imagine other programs are, where, you know, trying to match the need is very challenging. So I wanted to shift a little bit to talk about um, collaborative care and pediatrics and some of our work there and the state of an overall model. So um, 
the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force um, has an imperative. It says that primary care clinicians can and should be able to provide mental health services to children and adolescents in that setting. And it actually goes further than that and states that it's the ideal place for identification of childhood mental illness. Um, which you know is a, a very big task to add to primary care pediatrics. This it can be coupled with the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry um, Group's presidential initiative. And although it's old now in 2013, the recommendations are that PCCs or primary care clinicians um, should and can identify, assess, and manage mild to moderate presentations of common psychiatric disorders. And the idea is that um, child and adolescent psychiatrists um, and other scarce resources should be conserved for the management of severe, complex, unsafe, and treatment unresponsive disorders. So you can begin to see why collaborative care is thought of as one potential answer to this issue. Um, we see that 50% of all mental illness begins before age 14 and 75% before age 24. We know that early intervention improves outcomes. We also know that 50% of pediatric office visits involve some form of you know, potential mental health concern. And we also know that child and adolescent psychiatrists being scarce um, can't provide the majority of mental health care, and that pediatric primary care clinicians do write the majority of psychotropic prescriptions for youth. So there are three different known models of uh, integration with um, the stepwise up approach um, that collaborative and integrative care is really the ideal. University of Vermont has created something called a practice integration profile, which essentially looks at how integrated um, practices are um, and really rating them according to their integration level. Uh, traditional consultation is considered a coordinated way uh, and, and kind of a precursor to collaborative care. This is through just telepsychiatry or telephone child psychiatry access programs. Um, we have them in Vermont and they're um, you know, gaining popularity uh, nationally are a form of this kind of model. Um, then there's co-location, which is that mental health specialist practice in the same office as others um, in primary care. And they do direct evaluation and follow up um, for a period of time, or that can be indefinitely. I was a co-located um, consultation psychiatrist for a period of time in this role. Um, and so I put a bullet point here that um, there is an alone in an office with a plan phenomenon, which is that, um, you know, co-location, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're collaborating. You can see patient after patient in an office by yourself with a plan um, and, uh, pay, uh, you know, seeing a patient and family over a, a period of time. And you don't necessarily have that kind of natural education, collaboration, or even the time to do it. Um, so collaborative and integrative care has really, uh, I think, risen to um, the top of ideas of how do we improve access um, and collaboration um, with these providers in primary care who are often doing a great subset of um, mental health care? Collaborative care is different because it focuses on indirect means of consultations. E-consults are um, one of those examples as our ongoing educational offerings, at least through our group, we're doing the ECHO series that's available to all um, Vermonters and primary care practices. The psychiatrists and the team generally support practices in doing um, you know, initial management. So the thought is that primary care providers may be doing steps one and two of a treatment algorithm. Um, and then we reserve the specialty direct service for more complex cases in this population health approach. Formal consults are different in that they don't result in reflexive follow-up with the person who did the consultation. They result in follow-up with primary care. And the idea of the hub and spoke um, approach here is that there is continued back and forth consultation and discussions of the case and in-person follow-up um, as needed with the consultant. So this idea is trying to get the right care at the right time um, to patients um, and really using the specialty expertise and resource at a well-timed, uh, in a well-timed way. And I would say that this is very challenging. Um, I think it's challenging to take this approach. Um, many times one hopes, I think, as a someone who's referring to specialty care is that someone will take on um, the care indefinitely and 
things sometimes don't get better. Um, you know, it's, it's an idealized form to think that, you know, everyone's going to get better with X amount of sessions or with the first step. So, uh, you know, for the chronic care piece, it's very hard, um, you know, because there's who sees this person when and why um, becomes a common um, source, I think, of challenge, um, but also a source of collaboration, um, especially if it's um, treated as a, you know, a, a, a collaborative relationship. We thankfully have shared medical records um, through EPIC. And we also have shared case discussion periods in time, um, which I think does help with collaboration. A lot of the feedback that we got when we were starting our model was that, you know, we must have access to records because we have, uh, if if you don't have, if we don't know what's happening, then, you know, we, we are very confused as primary care providers if we're doing this kind of hub and spoke and back and forth consultation. So we do have shared an open note notes, which I'm happy to talk about at a time like uh, what the experience of that has been and challenges there. And I lastly put a point about, um, you know, we talk about the primary care medical home. Um, and I think of Winnicott's idea of um, the good enough parent as being pretty apt for the good enough medical home, which is we have these ideas of what integration can be. And I think they can be quite idealized. Um, they can be idealized relationally um, in challenging systems. Um, and I think that, you know, we have to aspire maybe not to have the most ideal fluid integration, but have good enough uh, good integration. This is a framework um, pretty commonly cited. It's the SAMHSA Integrated Care Spectrum. Um, I just point out that on the um, for this level six of integration, so someone at the University of Vermont who uses the practice integration profile would say, you know, that is the most um, ideal level of care. And it does have some idealized language to it. Um, I would just point out full collaboration, transformed and merged, um, resolved most or all systems issues, which sounds like an impossibility um, as someone working in a system, um, consistent uh, communication, collaboration, shared vision. Um, you know, I think it's something that's a, a very aspirational. Um, I can say that they've done some studies around, um, they call them secret shoppers who go to integrated practices and look at, um, you know, what is it, how would they um, rate the level of integration? And even programs that say they're integrated um, may actually look a lot more co-located. Um, so it, it is an aspiration, but it is very challenging to, I think, continue to emulate all of those ideals and complicated systems that aren't always functioning around us. Um, so this is the treatment workflow through the clinical update through ACAP for pediatric COCM. Um, as you can see, you have two main resource ads. One is the psychiatrist um, and the other is the um, behavioral health care manager or collaborative care or mental health clinician. Um, and then we've added, of course, the specialty service connection um, with the relationship with the extension psychiatrist. Um, I think we always hope that we can build up a team, but again, we need to have funding in that extension group. Um, I think it can be challenging to be the single psychiatrist for someone who's been identified as having um, higher level needs than what our team can do. So while they're very connected um, with us, I think we also want to build up that person having a team around them as well with different multidisciplinary approaches. We also have a population-based registry and it's really encouraged that screening is done through um, the Pediatric Symptom Checklist 17. We've had a lot of trouble operationalizing that since it's not naturally available in our EPIC. Um, so they, the scores exist on paper somewhere. Um, it's also not routinely part of the screening of pediatrics um, to do that. So I think that's an additional challenge that we've had um, in our implementation is that if someone's not naturally doing a screening score, it's a big practice change to suddenly start doing screening scores with people um, in your general office routine. I think initially we thought, oh, well, that's not too much to ask, but um, there was a huge amount of cognitive load and um, overburden in primary care. So we're just 
one specialty group that's asking for an, yet another thing. And I think um, when we look at it, we also have the endocrine group asking for more of and putting more on primary care. And then we have the nephrology group doing the same thing. So, you know, more and more um, primary care is being the group that's holding on to um, a lot of um, cases that maybe would be in specialty care. So I think we have to be mindful of what we ask and our expectations too. We have ongoing clinical supervision and consultation meetings and reviews. Um, and then we also have the um, behavioral health care manager reviewing a case list with primary care and ongoing clinical care conferences. So this is the role of the collaborative care mental health clinician. Um, for a caseload, they generally carry 50 to 80 patients at a time. Um, I would say in pediatrics, they certainly um, carry a lesser load of about 50 or even 40 patients at a time based on the overall need, um, just the general amount of people involved in the care of the families um, and working with other groups, including schools. Um, they offer brief uh, six to eight months interventions with a treat to target approach. So they'll get a baseline score and then track it over time for reduction. They use cognitive behavioral therapy primarily, behavioral activation, problem solving, and then parent management training is a main intervention that we use in pediatrics. Um, and then they use and document, uh, they are responsible for the registry, uh, tracking patients' progress. Um, and then they also have weekly meetings with the consulting psychiatrist to review their panel and cases um, and receive that supervision. And then we have this role being a hybrid role of televideo and in-person appointments available. The psychiatrist um, consults with um, the behavioral care manager and their caseload, provides e-consults with chart review recommendations. We do see patients um, for direct service visit, either remotely or in person. We often are the ones to determine a diagnosis and set a treatment plan and then an algorithm. Um, I often say to patients, I'm the one to see someone when they're at potentially an impasse or a stuck point, and hopefully I can move um, them and the primary care provider in a different or right direction. We do make medication and non-medication recommendations, and I think one of our contributions that's really important is to the formulation of um, primary care providers and their team's ideas about a patient, um, especially for children or bringing in a kind of family-based approach orientation to a uh, child's mental health needs. And then we are also the ones to essentially gatekeep um, and connect with the hub psychiatrist for more extended care. And this is what's being asked of us as child psychiatrists in this model. Um, I would say diagnostic and management questions, of course, but also um, crisis and safety questions. I think it's it's very challenging um, to have a child in crisis. And so we are often, you know, got, trying to guide providers and what to do in those situations and help them access crisis services. We also get disposition questions and connection questions, which I think is interesting because um, it shows you just how diverse the landscape is of mental health care and that it's hard to know who does what um, and what everyone's level of expertise is. And so I may connect someone with a, the, our community health team or our social worker for these, um, for these concerns. However, I think there's something telling that these are the questions we receive because um, I tell some of the residents I work with, you know, when we're starting, you really are developing a relationship with all the providers and the practice, and you're essentially uh, training them on what does a psychiatrist do and what um, value do we have um, and what are other team members and really um, championing their value and um, what they do. Um, and oftentimes they're talking about, you know, psychotherapy and how important it can be to um, someone's outcome and how it can improve a patient or family's outcome. Um, so I'm really championing the behavioral health care manager and their work too. This is an example um, of the PSC 17. Um, these are the general cutoff scores recommended. This is from Seattle Children's. Um, looking at a child who has internalizing, externalizing attention or overall scores and trying to track them over time. These are other examples through the APA. It has a special populations guidebook um, for collaborative care in pediatrics. So one can take a treat to target approach and used several different freely available scales. And again, what we've found is 
finding people to do the screening in general is a challenge. And I'll show um, a graphic on that. So there is an evolving pediatric collaborative care evidence base. Um, I just put the clinical update that um, was put out through the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry just this last year, February 2023, that looks at what the evidence base is, the growing evidence base. Um, there certainly is more and more evidence for adolescents with depression, which makes sense since that was really the origin of collaborative care on depression in adults. Um, and various other adult um, kind of conditions, like chronic conditions that have some connection to depression. So you can see how uh, you know the evidence base may be building certainly in those areas. This is an example of um, the different, uh, more evolved <laughs> programs than certainly ours, um, who have uh, really shown some very good. Uh, you know, responses to collaborative care for pediatrics. Um, again, I'll note that a lot of this does have kind of an adolescent and depression focus, which I think is to be expected considering um, the origin of, you know, collaborative care and its most robust evidence base. So the APA has made um, some key adjustments that they recommend for pediatric populations. Um, Certainly, we um, encourage the BHCM to engage with parents as full partners, and I would say also take a family-based approach to collaborative care, um, knowing that that is essential for um, kids and getting better. We also have uh, much more of an interface with child-serving systems, as I mentioned, which does um, you know take time for the behavioral health care manager, and so we have an adjustment in caseload in order to represent that. Um, Another part of the APA guidelines is that a general, and we do this in our program, a general psychiatrist um, with experience and, and comfort in diagnosis and treatment of children who is supervised by a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I provide that supervision, can see children under the age of 18. Um, and it's thought to be a very good use of that resource, particularly for adult psychiatrists who are in family medicine practices in our group. Um, so I can provide ongoing um, supervision of those cases, and then expand the overall general psychiatry reach as well. And then lastly, for clinical measures, we recommend that um, patient and parent reports are done um, rather than just um, patient. This is some of our data. Again, we're a program in our infancy um, of less than a year. So um, we have worked really hard to prioritize access to appointments based on what we have in terms of our own outpatient access challenges. Um, these are our referral list um, that we've had over the last 12 months. Um, you can see in the last month, um, we're doing <laughs> maybe a bit better in our referral volume. And our goal is that um, we are going to have someone at least scheduled and have an appointment with um, in five days and that that appointment will be within two weeks. And I just put this up because this is a, our data on screening, so and it's specific to pediatrics. So this is the percentage um, opportunity for uh, PHQ-9. Um, so for example, this last month, 209 opportunities, and yet the screening rate is at 50%, which you know, when I've talked about other with other groups, they've said, oh, that's a pretty good screening rate. But um, for collaborative care and looking at this in terms of like a population health model, we really do want to see uh, generally, they say um, screening rates up to 80%, so you have a better understanding of the population. So we are challenged in even the initial steps of having more universal um, mental health screening. This is some of our early outcomes. Again, we're using um, PHQ-9 and GAD-7. Um, certainly, we are challenged by having our PSC-17 um, not in EPIC. As you can see, that means that we don't have uh, easy input-output for data. But what you can see is that our initial GAD-7, PHQ-9, and 9A scores are in more of the moderate, moderate, severe, and severe range. I think that's pretty interesting knowing what we know about the evidence base for severe and complex cases. But I do think that 
what we end up seeing um, has to do with the fact if there's lack of capacity elsewhere, what we may be seeing are more severe symptoms from the very beginning. Um, and then our final scores, as you can see, we've had an improvement in GAD7s, uh, 36%, um, and PHQ9, about 27%. That by no means is matching to the data that um, I imagine that we could have. Um, up to 50% reduction over the course of six months um, is generally considered to be what is expected. So I think in starting with patients who maybe have higher severity scores, um, we may be a bit more challenged in, in reaching that full reduction, um, although I'm sure that there are other factors uh, that are playing into that as well. So I wanted to point out as um, a group doing this implementation, some of the challenges and criticism that we've reached. Um, as I've mentioned several times, the lack of consistent screening is a challenge. Um, there is uh, feedback that despite a task force imperative in pediatrics, that there is a lack of mental health training. And we think about that generally, generationally too. Um, so for our providers who have been in our system and are very much used to a referral out to specialty service uh, experience, this um, is certainly, they express that it's not, it was not within their training to um, learn how to do a lot of this work. So it's, um, we have very, variable levels of interest and expertise in mental health training, despite this kind of more idealized um, task force imperative. And then we have overburdened PCPs who we are one group who's telling them to do more when they have um, many other groups who are asking for more and more too. Um, that results, I think, in a common question, which is why as a consulting group, do you not just take on difficult patients? Um, and definitely that is what we want. That is what would be helpful to us. Um, and these models really look at, you know, trying to increase the uh, abilities within primary care and also not have indefinite kind of care around um, certain patients, because then you're really providing so much service to one patient when you could provide more uh, service across a larger breadth of patients. We've also had uh, feedback that um, and this is from my child and adolescent training too, where people say, uh, you know, kids are not just smaller adults. So how can you apply successful models for adults to children? So hopefully over time, more and more evidence can accrue and we can see that, you know, with some adjustments, these models can be successful as they are for adults as well. We have inadequate reimbursement. So in a fee-for-service um, model as we are, that is a challenge uh, for working and in more intensive mental health needs. And this is a busy work day with a grueling pace, and we struggle too with limited psychiatry resources for a referral out. So we've created our own stepped up care. Um, that's also limited because we, that's not an indefinite resource either. So in summary, these are Hub and Spoke and COCM are successful models um, and they provide new challenges for integration with new populations. There has been some success in adolescents with depression, um, but we still need to have more uh, understanding and information about um, how this affects uh, children and families. The operational and implementation challenges are real, um, and advanced programs even struggle to emulate what the integration ideal is. So um, in doing this work, I think there's common and expected uh, challenges and resistances, and hopefully we can all share knowledge and um, learn how we can all better these programs by understanding some of those common challenges. And lastly, there's universal screening for mental health concerns is recommended, but it is a key initial challenge um, with everything as far as who does it, where do they record it, and what do you do with that information? For example, if you see someone who has higher acuity scores, um, how do you connect them to services as collaborative care is not the best option. And then I wanted to end with this positive note of some busy, uh, some resources that you can use in a busy practice. Um, rating scales are certainly also available um, as are these other resources. We've done, we've um, really appreciated Seattle Children's um, Primary Care Principles for Child Mental Health, which includes everything from um, treatment algorithms to rating scales um, and different resources. And then I have some additional references and resources here. 
And lastly, I just want to say thank you. Um, this is our this is our uh, leadership team here. I have Carrie Stanley, who's our um, lead behavioral health care manager. Um, and then I have Clara Keegan, who's our lead family medicine um, physician on this program and myself. And I also have a little cartoon where we, um, I would say that we in doing our integration are like that little hedgehog there um, where we're getting by inch by inch, little by little, um, but that's also okay and necessary. And no, Vermont is not snowing right now, even though this is a, I think a an apt uh, infographic for Vermont, um, but we are about 30 and so a little a little chilly, but sunny, but we've had some pretty gray and rainy days. Um, but I see that I've left about 10 minutes for questions as I was told. So um, I can stop sharing my screen and hopefully we can have some questions. Thank you. I would like to say thank you to Dr. Pavlovsky. Um, even if you rubbed it in about having sun, Rochester is the city of gray here, um, but thank you for letting us know that it's sunny where you are. We do have plenty of time for questions. Yes, Dr. Pulley. Um, I have uh, I have two questions, but they're both uh, kind of large, so I'll stick with one to start with. Um, I'm a consult psychiatrist. I do both inpatient consults and I do um, embedded work in dermatology. And uh, one thing that I've been thinking about more and more is this question of screening, but specifically, um, it's actually more the question of diagnostic diagnostics and how actually very incredibly complex triage is. Um, and yet we put triage um, like almost down the skill level, like in terms of the amount of training that the people who do it have. Um, in the specific thing. And so something that, you know, and I'm in a very like niche practice, but that idea of flipping it on its head where I triage and because I can like immediately determine very quickly whether a patient needs my full eval or if there's something that I can just weigh in on the chart. Um, and so I get kind of like, I'm starting to get um, this question of screening and all the false positives that it generates. Uh, but then a lot of, I see a lot of stuff that gets missed when I've been in um, other clinics and I see what the doctors are seeing and they don't know what they're looking at. Um, if it's not disruptive, if it's not like they, it could be something very intervenable they can't even see. And so this question of screening at all, like, I don't want to say at all, I'd be very provocative, but like this question of screening as being done by not the specialist and then being done by instrument, um, like I'm struggling with it more and more in terms of whether or not that's actually um, like how we end up using our skills the best. Uh, that was a little rambly, so I apologize. <laughs> No, I, I agree with you. So the psychiatrists, we we get all the referrals and we do the triage with the behavioral health care manager. I can say that the feedback is that um that we shouldn't be doing that because it should it's not at uh this feedback that people are giving now. I see I feel like in the last few years, but it's not of like a top of the license thing to do and that it should be outsourced to somebody else. But I agree with you. I think that there's something that I can glean um, from a chart review that I feel very anxious kind of outsourcing to somebody who doesn't have that kind of lens. And then the feedback I get is I should probably train somebody else to do that, <laughs> which I guess just means taking my brain and putting it elsewhere. But um, yeah, I have the same. Sorry, can I clarify one thing real quick? Yeah. When I say triage, I actually like I triage my people in person because I go in with the dermatologist. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it is like I will say like the chart wise, um, I think that's true. The, the, my, the thing that I've been struggling over is that question of like you can get so much with a five second in person, like pop in here, I'm here and then I can that that's that's the gap that I've been struggling with. But I, I agree with you that the chart is like not necessarily where the money is on that. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. We've had, um, and there's certainly models that I've seen that do more of the warm handoff approach and I've done them myself. Um, and I think what's interesting is that, you know, for the people we've hired, we get some resistance, honestly, to the warm kind of handoff approach, um, which I'd be here curious to hear more about that. Um, because the idea is that, I mean, especially administratively, it requires some kind of freedom in someone's schedule that they're able to do that. Um, and we've been, I think, pressured to do, you know, certainly more and more direct service to the point that we don't have that availability or free time. Um, but I do think that, I mean, if you look at uh, warm handoffs and what 
that does, I mean, it can increase um, utilization. It can help with follow-up. Um, it can help, as you said, you know, see things that can otherwise be seen in a chart. You often hear the um, comment, you know, I'm not my chart, you know, <laughs> like obviously like people are complex um, and, you know, one cannot um, glean everything one can from a record review. Thank you so much. We have a question from Dr. Nasra. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, my question is, um, I'm curious about your business model um, that you implemented. So is the team employed by the University of Vermont, the psychiatrists, the behavioral health clinicians, uh, and then you outsource them to the practices or are they hired by the practices? And how are you doing in terms of financial sustainability? Is this program being subsidized, being backstopped, or are you able to break even? Yeah, so um, we are now, and this has happened in the last year or so, so it's definitely a point of change, but we are a network um, department, um, and that is how most of our departments are now. So everyone is hired through the network department um, chair of psychiatry. The uh, local sites um, do, um, we try as best we can to interview with them um, to meet people um, who we employ, but everyone is employed through the network. Um, I can say that proves its own challenge because if you're coming from a primary care standpoint and you um, are working in your setting, um, how challenging is it to suddenly have your new psychiatrist who you maybe haven't um, <laughs> hired yourself? Um, so that's a challenge, I think. Um, and we definitely receive feedback on that, but um, that's how it's structured. Um, they're all employed through the network department um, and then they are essentially leased to different hospitals. Um, our funding, um, which is really interesting because there's a lot of grant funding in collaborative care um, across the board. And whenever I've gone to the national groups, people are surprised that we've been funded through our network um, as a division of the department, um, which does confer some stability. It's as part of the mental health strategic plan. The idea is that we, um, you know, are the ones who are improving upon our access problem. We do operate at a loss. Um, we do not break even by any means. Um, the Penn Group, um, Dr. Oslin, uh, David Oslin runs, has said that certainly models like these can break even if billing collaborative care codes um, and through what they have, which is, um, you know, an a center for triage, essentially, where they receive in, uh, phone calls um, from any, you know, referral source, um, and then they char are able to charge for the time that the triage person is doing that kind of collaborative care and resource connection. So um, we do not have at all in our business model um, any kind of uh, site that's doing the triage because we're doing the triage ourselves as a team. But um, certainly models have broken even, um, but not not uh, in doing it this way. I it's um, it, that's an aspiration certainly, and I think would add more potential stability for our, our ongoing um, investment. Well, I, I'm recognizing that it's one o'clock, maybe one minute after. So I just want to say on behalf of our department, uh, a, you know, a huge thank you to Dr. Pavlovsky. This has been a very thought provoking talk. And I know you're going to have some time with some members of our department in the next hour. And in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for an excellent talk. Oh, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.